This is Robert Demers for Conman here at the Fantasia International Film Festival, and I'm here with B.P. Cooper, the co-writer and producer of Time Lapse, and Bradley King, the co-writer and director of Time Lapse. How are you both doing today? Good, really good. Yeah, it's been a good festival. Yeah, doing great. Thanks. Uh, can you please tell our audience a little bit about your film? Uh, oh boy, all right. <laughs> uh, it's basically uh, three roommates discover their old scientist neighbor dead in his apartment and they find a, uh, a machine that takes pictures of the future. And instead of reporting the body, they decide to hide it and use the machine for their benefit, but it's a thriller, so things go horribly wrong. What has it meant to you both that your film has been so well received so far and to the fact that it's even both showings here at the festival have been sold out? Well, it's beyond our wildest expectations, really. Like, this was one of the festivals, one of the very top festivals on the list, where it's like, if we get in there, then we're going to celebrate <laughs> and drink some champagne because it's just so well so well respected and well known um, all around the globe, really. And for the, the type of fans that frequent fantastic festivals, this one is at the top of everyone's list as well so it, it's just it's an honor and yeah it's exceeded our wild expectation our wildest expectations i think the way it's been received so far yeah I, I mean i don't know what to add to that my wildest expectations would be that we like get driven there in a gold-plated limo so my <laughs> wildest expectations weren't quite met but cooper's were my wild expectations have definitely been met. what was the inspiration for making time lapse uh it was sort of two-pronged. There was a practical uh, inspiration, which was basically we, we love science fiction. We've written bigger budget sci-fi scripts, uh, but we knew we needed to do something lower budget. And so um, there was that sort of impetus, you know, and we were always obsessing, like, how could we do something a la Primer or Time Crimes or, you know, that could be done with small crew, one location, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then, you know, we also love time travel and we love science fiction, and so, you know, I think... We were, we're also genuinely inspired by this type of material, you know. Technically, though, Cooper came up with the actual camera idea, so. The camera, the jumping off point for the camera was based on a film called Timeline, which was a Paul Walker vehicle from the early 2000s, and in it there is a time machine where someone goes missing and they actually have to put a, a physical camera inside of a time machine, and they point it up at the sky to take a picture of the nighttime, you know, the constellations in the sky, and based on that data, they can determine where this machine sent this missing person, and also when in time it sent this person. So, in essence, that that camera was acting almost like a time machine in and of itself. And I pitched that thought to Bradley: what if what if a camera could see yesterday or tomorrow or what have you? And then he came in the office the next day with pretty much the the the, the idea of it's a huge camera, it's two buildings, it's looking across one way, there's you know, roommates, and it was just kind of too juicy of, a, of an idea to not just start writing, so. Well, this is your first theatrical film. Was it uh, everything you hoped for to, to make this a uh, big of a scale project? Yeah, I think, um, my expectations for myself were pretty low. I mean, I've, I've written a lot of short scripts and I've you know, worked on a lot of big feature screenplays, but I kind of just made a deal with myself. As long as I made something that wasn't embarrassing, I would be able to pat myself on the back at the end. You know, I just wanted to make a movie that I could point to and say, hey, look, I can make a movie, you know, and then hopefully have an easier time raising money for the next one. So when it turned out, um, as it did, pretty well, and the audience seems to be responding, and we're getting into festivals and winning awards, I think, uh, yeah, I, I felt like I had, you know, ex exceeded my own sort of uh, goal line. And uh, Mr. Cooper, this is your first time in a writing position from your pre previous work as a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd that feel to be more the, uh, in depth into the filmmaking process? It's honestly my favorite part. Um, and I, I look forward to doing it again. It's just really nice to be able to dive into something from the inception phase and to be able to help craft creatively where the story is going to go. It's it's also a bit of a struggle 
um, mentally having you have to take the producer hat off when when you're writing in order to extract like really good material but you also find yourselves automatically putting it on the minute you know something's mentioned that sounds like it costs a lot of money or it's logistically very complicated or to, you know it's like wait we can't afford that but I don't know it might also help too uh, yeah, yeah, a little for bit sure. sometimes those financial limitations mm, force you to be more creative mm -hmm. you know and I think in a way I was grateful that the concept was so limited you know that it was two apartments and uh, the camera was so big I mean I think some of those limitations did force us to to come up with you know more creative twists maybe than if we had been able to say oh well, and then the camera goes you know onto a space shuttle it's like well, then you yeah. start getting lazy you know? <laughs> exactly. yeah, and I think I think ultimately for me it's I, I, I finally made a movie that I know I wanted to see, hmm. you know, because because of the involvement in the writing phase. So. I think that's always important when you're making film that you actually want to see it. Yeah, and not not that I haven't wanted to see other films I've worked on. Uh, save. The, well, <laughs> there, there are there are like Metrics film I love and I and I love yeah. the movie Special, but there are some movies I've worked on that that I that I didn't care too much really what what uh, I don't know what I was going to see in the theater I just wanted to do the best job I could do and it was sort of up to everyone else to complete it but yeah. in this one it was we, we had to round up a really talented crew and, and post-production team and it was all on us to to make sure that everybody else had the resources necessary to help create this yeah, film, so. and I think, you know, I have, this is my first film that I've made, but I've worked on a lot of other movies, and it is, it's tough, even being a crew member on something that you don't really, would never want to see is hard, you know, but at least you're getting paid. I think when I've worked on movies and observed the people at the top, like the director or the producers working on it, and clearly they were into it, you know, for financial reason, reasons or connections they were going to make or whatever, I just, I always marvel, it's like, how can you get up every day and do this amount of work because it's a ridiculous amount of work you know I mean you're just <laughs> yeah. working for like two years 16 hours a day basically you know non-stop and uh, it just uh, yeah I, I don't think I could do it unless I really want you know wanted to see the movie at the end of it so yeah and, and we got very fortunate with having like Andrew Kaiser who did our score and mm -hmm. Tom Cross our, our editor um, Rick Montgomery who is also a producer uh, Sarah Craig another producer people who came on for, for little to no money, they were doing it because they loved the project and they believed in the project. And that, I think that's why it turned out so well, really. Yeah. So. Well, we're also really smart, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Forgot about that part. <laughs> what was the writing process like between the both of you? Uh, a lot of screaming, you know, yeah. breaking chairs, um, drunken. We you know. only... T sit next to each other in interviews now because yeah, we can't yeah, stand yeah, on the side totally. of each other. <laughs> but you live next to each other, don't you? Yeah, we do. That's <laughs> we right. Do. Yeah, we're about five minutes away. But um, he blacked out his windows so I yeah, can see yeah, in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, we've agreed. Like, he gets to walk <laughs> on this side of the street and I walk on this side. Yeah. No, it was really good. You know, we had, um, I had written a lot of screenplays before and I always took them to Cooper and he would read them and give me notes. Um, I don't know why, and I've worked with writing partners before, but I don't know why we had just never really gotten to the point where we tried to write something together. Um, to be fair, I didn't know that he even wanted to write, I think, until the day that he came up with the camera idea and we were in the car talking about it. And, and then, you know, I just thought about, I was like, well, why don't we, you know, should we write this together? And he was like, yeah. And so we started and it was really, I mean, I don't know if it'll be as, as quick and dreamy of a process next time as it was this time, but uh, it was really good. It was very fast and not a lot of arguments. Yeah, it was smooth. It was good. What would you say was your most memorable moment from the production? Boy, that's a tough one. Most memorable moment. Um, of course, shooting Danielle in the face with the blood is probably what immediately <laughs> comes yeah. to mind. Do you have another one? That um, well, that, that's while cameras are rolling. That's a good one while cameras mm -hmm. are rolling. I guess when cameras weren't rolling, a fire broke out right next to our set in the middle of the night and we had our crew members trying to put it. it wasn't we didn't do it it was like this neighboring property but our crew members all jumped on top of it with like a hose and tried to put it out the fire truck came um, I don't know there are a lot of every set has their war stories I guess we had our fair share yeah some some we probably shouldn't mention 
definitely. Whatever you're thinking, don't mention it. Um, the blood story, though, to encapsulate it really quickly, I guess, you know, um, uh, a moment happens in the movie where Danielle, not to give anything away, but Danielle uh, Panabaker gets some blood on her face. And, um, you know, she wears contact lenses, and also the blood reset is a, it's an ordeal, because they have to, you know, wash it off and then redo her makeup, and then, you know, it's a, it's a long process, and on an indie film, you just don't have time to do that, you know, 20 times in a row, so. Or even twice. Or even twice, actually. There was a lot <laughs> yeah. of pressure, and, you know, I forget what, it was like our, our makeup artist, who was great, uh, Catherine, she ended up having to go to a wedding, and so her assistant was going to have to do it, and she was really nervous, and I don't blame her, you know, because you're shooting the main actress in the face with blood, and. And Danielle was asking, you know, could we could we avoid her eyes and just sort of like get her cheek? And I was like, fine, you know, perfect, that's fine. No one could get it right, so I ended up having to do it. And I practiced and practiced on my assistant, and I got it like perfect every time. And then the moment came to do it, and I I, I choked and I shot her right in the eyes, you know. And I I was so mortified. I, I you know, at that point, thankfully, we had had a few weeks of shoot behind us, so we had a rapport, and and, I, and she forgave me, but. I, I just, I was, you know, I had that brief moment. I was like, well, my career's over. I just shot <laughs> Daniel Panabaker in the eyes with uh, fake blood. Um, but it turned out okay. Yeah, she was a sport about it. Yeah, she was cool. Now, for all our audience who wants to see it and that aren't able to see it at the Fantasia, where can they look forward to see it released at other places or in the future? Um, I guess we're very close to being able to answer that concretely. What, what do you want to say? Well, there's a slew of other festivals coming up both internationally and domestically. And instead of rattling them off here, uh, if they go to our website, timelapse-themovie.com, we're constantly updating the different festivals that we're getting into and, and putting out little news releases. And um, and yeah, and then traditional releases is just around the corner in terms of uh, signing a deal. Mm -hmm. um, as far as it coming out, that could be later, end of this year, early next year. Well, thank you both for talking with us, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Oh, can I say one thing? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I've been forgetting to say this, and I really need to say it. I think uh, a lot of people don't realize for indie films, you know, it is so vital if you see it and like it in, at a festival or on VOD to, to tweet about it or write a review on IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes because, you know, for a big movie, it's just people's hobby to write a little review, but for an indie film, it can make the difference between us you know, getting distribution in Canada or getting distribution in a country, you know, if enough people become aware of it, suddenly, you know, a distributor gets interested and, and we have a chance to show it to, to more people. So uh, I just ask everybody if they see it to, uh, you know, go write about it. Yeah, that's a good point. Because just because it gets released, let's say, in the U.S. doesn't doesn't mean it'll get a release in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that the people spread the word if, if they enjoy it. And that just yeah. increases the chances of it getting out. And if they don't enjoy it, say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to say anything bad about it. Definitely just say nothing. Yeah. <laughs>